Civilization and industrialization have brought a lot of good things into our lives. No argument there. For example, we no longer have to walk miles to contact our friends and family, which is great. You don't have to move to a new apartment because you found a spider in your room that you're absolutely terrified of. <laughs> Any fairy girl, gone are the days when you spend at least a day in each month lying on the floor in your room, reading in pain and praying for a sweet, merciful death. You get the picture. But, as a side effect, these lead to a regular chemical assault on the cells of our body anytime we're exposed to any of this stuff. More technically put, xenobiotics. <laughs> Welcome to another medic video, stick around and we'll get to the juicy stuff in a gif. When you split the word xenobiotic, it literally means stranger and relating to a living organism. Therefore, xenobiotics could be said to be strangers to a living environment, and in this case, they're anything in your body that isn't meant to be there. Mostly because it's not usually produced in your body. Some stuff, however, like bile and steroids could undergo similar reactions as xenobiotics, but they're not strictly xenobiotics, because your body actually produces them, and the whole point of calling something a xenobiotic is because it's a stranger to your body. On this note, I should probably mention that foods are not classified as xenobiotics, natural foods at least. And if you're wondering why, well, it's because your body is made up of them. Protein builds muscle and basically most parts of the body. Fats are in the skin. Carbohydrates also contribute to the structure of cell membranes, aside from their major function as energy givers. So natural foods are not xenobiotics, however, they could contain them when they've been modified with preservatives and so on. So as you can see, these guys are all around us, just lurking and waiting to get in. <laughs> and most of the time, they do get in, but thanks to this awesome body that God gave us, we have a way to get rid of them. Even the ones that we ingested on purpose, like prescription medication or that ice cream that we all love so much, for good reason I might add. <laughs> Excretion of xenobiotics is really important because if they overstay their welcome, then the hero becomes the villain. So it's pretty cool that basically all tissues in our body have some ability to metabolize xenobiotics, but obviously some do way more than others. So in descending order, we have the liver, which does the bulk of the work, and then these other guys contribute a good chunk to the GIT, the kidneys, the skin. As you can imagine because it's so exposed then the lungs and the brain and then we have the remaining tissues in the body just contributing minutely but as with everything in life there are some exceptions to this some drugs when taken orally like chlorpromazin <laughs> are metabolized more in the intestine than in the liver while some like midazolam are metabolized roughly in the same proportion in the intestine as in the liver this tells us that our intestines actually have some major gain when it comes to drug modification and all. So when liver function is compromised, the intestines could swoop in to save the day. It's not a pretty organ, but they say beauty is on the inside, right? <laughs> this is proof. And this brings us to the first pass effect. This happens when stuff get into our GIT by eating or by using a drug orally. And instead of just getting into our bodies and going straight into general circulation because God knows what on earth it is that we have eating, <laughs> they are sent to the liver first through the hepatic portal vein. The liver then does what it does best by destroying, in quote, the foreign and weird stuff as we will soon see, so that only a small proportion gets into the general circulation and this proportion is called bioavailability. So simply put, bioavailability of a drug is the percentage of the drug that gets into systemic circulation. But as we saw for some drugs, the intestines also play a big part in this by modifying a proportion of it before it even gets sent to the liver. Therefore, some drugs could be said to have a heavy first pass effect where only a teeny tiny bit gets away from the liver and into general circulation. And in this case, they usually have to be administered in a different way, like intravenously. In a case where it is administered intravenously, it could be said to have a 100% bioavailability because all of it obviously gets into the systemic circulation. So a big thing to note is that most xenobiotics are lipophilic, meaning that they do not dissolve in water. So if you think about it, relating to the kidneys, which are like the major organs of excretion, then we could have a big problem. <laughs> I mean, we're saying that this 
potentially really harmful substances can dissolve in water, which would mean that they can be part of the glomerular filtrate that gets into the nail fronts. This would also mean that they cannot be excreted through the kidneys, which would further mean that they end up going back into general circulation, and then we are stuck with the way higher concentration of them than we should have in our body. So, this dilemma is basically the whole point of the biotransformation reactions that we're going to have to happen to these guys so that they can get excreted out of the body and so that we can, you know, stay alive and everything. Also important to know is that in the process of making them more soluble through these reactions, their action gets terminated. Think of it as an enzyme, for example. An enzyme needs to have an active site that is compatible with the substrate, and the whole point of enzyme inhibition is generally to alter this active site so that it can no longer bind with its substrate. So this is what I'm saying generally happens to xenobiotics when they undergo processing in the liver and stuff. It's basically like killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> it's pretty efficient. But, and this is one very big but, for a number of substances, the opposite happens. Meaning that when they go through these reactions, they actually become more active or they become activated. So here, they're referred to as pro-drugs because they got activated after the modification reaction. There are two phases of reactions that xenobiotics undergo in the body that allow them to be excreted. And these reactions are important because without them, it would take forever to completely get rid of them. And like I already explained, for them to pass through the kidney, which is like the major excretory organ, they need to be dissolved first. Phase 1 reactions are generally called functionalization reactions. And in phase 1, the point is generally to add a polar functional group to the compound or to unmask the functional group. If this reaction makes the xenobiotic polar enough, it can be excreted directly, but if not, it will have to pass through phase 2 before getting excreted. But sometimes, just because they can, I guess, <laughs> a compound will pass through phase 2 first before phase 1. And an example is the drug isoniazid, which is used to treat tuberculosis. For xenobiotics that skip phase 1 reactions and go straight to phase 2 before they are excreted, means that they already are the polar enough functional group, so they don't need to pass through phase 1. Also, phase 1 reactions are mostly redox reactions, and here are some examples. And as you can see, they are broadly grouped into three major categories, oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis. The family of enzymes that catalyzes most phase 1 reactions are called the cytochrome P450s. They can also be called monooxygenases or mixed function oxygenases. However, phase 2 reactions are called conjugation reactions or coupling reactions. And what they do is that they transfer endogenous compounds, and by endogenous I mean compounds generally produced in the body. So they transfer them to the polar group that was added in phase 1, for those that pass through phase 1. And this makes the product even more soluble and more deactivated. Now, I wasn't putting emphasis on transfer <laughs> for nothing. Because the enzymes that catalyze these reactions are generally called transferases. For example, sulfotransferase in sulfation. So basically, when you see transferase, or at least a trans in the enzyme name for a biotransformation reaction, you can be 95% sure that it's a phase 2 reaction. And I say 95% because, well, you never know. <laughs> An exception here is water conjugation. The enzyme responsible is epoxide hydrolysis, and I know this makes it sound like a phase 1 reaction, but it's not. So these are examples of phase 2 reactions. The end of the line for xenobiotics processing is excretion. There are different routes that can be passed for them to get to this end game. There is the good boy that goes through phase 1, then phase 2, then excretion. There is the very good boy that goes through only phase 1 or only phase 2 before excretion. And then there is the confused boy <laughs> that turns it all upside down. He goes through phase 2 before phase 1, before excretion. <laughs> Easy peasy, I know. Also, the first pass effect greatly reduces the concentration of xenobiotics, including drugs, obviously, that get into systemic circulation.